Hello. Let's go on in our study of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I've entitled this The Bottom Line. What does one need to know to be born again? What do you need to believe? And we're, we're going to examine that. We're going to examine why it's worthwhile to believe it, why it's trustworthy. And uh, first we're going to pray, and then we'll jump right in. Ready? Thank you, Lord, for this your word. We ask that you open us up to receive it, that you open up the words to bore right into where we need them, and that we would grow in and, and go on with the Lord in such a way that you can produce in us good fruit of the Spirit and blessing that comes from you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Alrighty. If you remember last time, we were talking about the testimony of the Scripture. Paul starts in and he says, I want to remind you about the gospel that I preached to you, which he said you received and, and, and you're saved by it, unless you have thought you were just wasting your time. And he says, I delivered to you what was most important, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised again according to the Scripture. And, and so we looked at those Scriptures last week, if you recall, and we talked about how <clears throat> the Scriptures backed up what Paul was saying. The scriptures really did tell about his death for our sins. The scriptures really did tell about his rising from the dead, the first fruits of those who would pass away and then, then come out to eternal life. Now, Paul goes on to say that not only were there details of his death, burial, and resurrection uh, in the scripture and written out ahead of time so we'd recognize it when it happened, there are also overwhelming eyewitnesses to the event of his resurrection. So think about this. If if you want to present a legal argument for something that has happened, a historical event, then you'd want good eyewitnesses to that fact, wouldn't you? Now, I say a legal argument because you cannot prove any historical event scientifically. In order for something to have scientific proof, it means that you need to have the re ability to repeat the thing under control controlled conditions so that you can observe and see if it really comes out the way that's been reported. That's the way it is with science. But for historical events, things that have gone on in the past, you can only use legal evidence. For example, did the Revolutionary War really happen in the United States? Well, we who have been taught it in school and stuff say, well, of course it did. Well, how do you know? Well, there's writers who wrote about it, having been there, having seen it, and experienced what happened. There are battle sites around the country where you can go to the East Coast, especially you can see places where the fighting was done, and they're marked. In this site, at such such a date, a battle was fought for the Revolutionary War. Or there actually is a country called the United States of America, and it had to have come around, come about some way. So these are evidences, legal type evidences, that show, yes, there probably was a revolutionary war. But what you can't do is repeat the event under controlled circumstances. Nobody goes back and says, hey, Britain, we're going to fight with you one more time just to prove that it happened that way. Questions such as, did Abraham Lincoln really live? Or was there truly a, a war called World War II? Or did the World Trade Center really get destroyed by jet planes in 2001. Any historical thing has to be backed up by legal type evidence. It has to be, we have to ask questions. Did anybody see it happen? Do we know anyone that was involved in the incident? Are there reliable records from people we can trust? What evidence do we see in the aftermath? What's come about since then? It's interesting to me how often things that seem so clearly documented are often denied by people for whatever reasons later, such as, did the U.S. actually put astronauts on the moon? You hear people adamantly arguing, oh, that never really happened. Or was there a holocaust where certain people were, they tried to exterminate certain people during World War II? There are, there are photographic and eyewitness reports that say it happened, yet many people say, no, that never really happened. Or how about, <laughs> how about, uh, is the earth a round globe or is it, is it flat? Is it a pancake or a globe? And uh, I've heard people 
talking as if they were seriously thinking that the earth is actually flat. And maybe you've personally read some of the things from people. But I have personally sailed from San Francisco Bay around the world to the middle of the Indian Ocean to an island called Diego Garcia. It's about 13,500 13, miles from San Francisco to Diego Garcia. That's over halfway. Meaning, if the earth was flat, I would have gone off the edge at some point around there. If I had gone just a little over 10,000 miles more, we could have come on around and been back home again, going the same way. Is the earth flat or is the earth round? Well, I'd have to tell you from my eyewitness account, it's round. When we get to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 5 through 8, we're going to see where it tells us that there were eyewitness accounts of Jesus being raised from the dead. So he says, Verse 3, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And then Paul starts setting out the eyewitnesses. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. And by that, he means they've passed away. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Now, this is what we're going to talk about. Let's start in, and who were these eyewitnesses? Who was Cephas? If you look at John 1 and verse 42, you, you see a verse in which Jesus met Simon, the one that we later called Peter. He says, he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you're Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Okay, now this is using languages that we're not, not used to using. The Aramaic language, the Aramaic language, Cephas means stone. When you translate that over to Greek, which is what the New Testament was translated into, the word Petros, that we get the name Peter from, means rock. So basically, when the Lord Jesus met Peter, he says, your name's Simon, I'm going to call you Rocky. Because he said he was, he was calling him by a name that, was, that means the same thing. It means rock, Cephas, or Petros, Peter, means rock. In Luke 24, verses 33 and 34, it says this. And they got up that very hour, and it's talking about the two in who had gone on the road to Emmaus after Jesus was raised from the dead. And they returned to Jerusalem and found gathered there the eleven and those who were with them. That's an important phrase. We're going to see some more about that in a little while. Saying, the Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon, Cephas, Peter. And so the account went on. Jesus had shown himself to him. So first of all, it says he appeared to Cephas, Peter, Rocky. And then it says to the 12. And this refers to the 12 who Christ had picked out as being his inner circle, those 12 that would stay the closest to him to be instructed at hand by he himself. And at the time, Peter wrote, or at the time Paul wrote, the 12 had been reduced to 11 because Judas was lost. He had betrayed Jesus, ended up committing suicide. But in Acts chapter 1, verse 12 through 26, the disciples felt they had scriptural leading to replace Judas with another who had been with them for the entire time, from the very beginning when Jesus was, was baptized and his whole public ministry until the time when he rose from the dead and went back to heaven. This was taken from Psalm 109, verse 8, in which it said, his place shall be taken by another. And he said, scripturally, this means we need to find someone to fill that vacancy after Judas was gone. By the Old 
Testament method of deciding a thing, they cast lots, and a man named Matthias was chosen. And if you look again at Luke 24, 33 and 34, this couple from Emmaus had found together the eleven and those who were with them. Remember I told you this would be something we referred to again? It's fairly certain that Matthias was one of those that was there in that group, because he was one who had been there from the beginning all the way through. And so, he was included as an eyewitness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he really did appear to the 12, Judas's seat being filled by one who rounded out the number again to 12 apostles. Third ones he appeared to, it says, and he appeared to a crowd of over 500. Now Paul is writing 1 Corinthians about 23 years after the resurrection of Jesus. And, and it says here that, that, um, that he appeared to this crowd of over 500, but there's no other reference to this appearance. And you wonder, well, when did that happen? Well, consider this. We're not told, for example, how many people were there when they watched him go up into the clouds and be, and be taken back into glory. We don't know of every time that he appeared while he was here. Um, I know that when they had watched Jesus ascend, if you read in Acts chapter 1, verse 44 and 5, and verses 9 through 11, that by the time they came back to Jerusalem, their group was, they had about 120 people, men and women together, who came to wait for the Holy Spirit to come, the promise that Jesus had said that they would receive. You read that in Acts 1, 12 through 15 as well. Well, the point of Paul's reference to witnesses to the point to point out Jesus' actual physical resurrection was to make the point that we're not talking about a spiritual resurrection where it only happened in the spirit or an imaginary thing that people just assume that this is what happened. We're talking about a real physical resurrection where Jesus came out of a grave in a physical body. Now, Admittedly, that body had been changed. It was glorified. It was different than it had been before. But it was a real physical resurrection. And so when it tells you about all of these people, 23 years later, he says, says, look, at one time it was over 500 people, and I can tell you who they are, and you can go ask them because they saw it. They're eyewitnesses to the fact. And you go on in 1 Corinthians 15, it says he appeared to this group of 500. Then in verse 7, it says, and he appeared to James and to all the apostles. When did he appear to James? Again, we're not told specifically when he visited James. But consider this. Jesus spent 40 days back there after he rose from the dead. And it's probable that there are quite a few appearances that we aren't told anything about. And here's why I say that. If you look, for example, at John 20, verses 30 and 31, we're told that Jesus did a lot more miracles than were ever written down. The ones that were recorded for, were for a purpose, that we might recognize that Jesus is the Messiah of God, Jesus the Christ, and that we are to believe and have eternal life in him. But he did a lot more than what was recorded. The same with his appearances. We were told about several eyewitness accounts but he appeared who knows how many times that we're not even told about because it doesn't further the story. Yes, he was there. The appearance to James was apparently one of those times. In verse 7, it goes on to say, when he had appeared to James, then he had to all the apostles. And consider again that there was a pool of people who had gone with Jesus the entire time of his ministry here. And... This was quite a large group by this time, dedicated to the truth of his resurrection and, and his saving grace. Um, for example, there, there's one other example where it talks about him sending out the apostles. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 1, there's a point in which Jesus sent out 70 people who went out and ministered in the villages around, who had the power to heal certain diseases, to cast out evil spirits to to do the work that, that he himself did. There were 70 at that time out of however many had been with him in all this time. So when it says he appeared to all the apostles, he appeared to the 12, but he appeared to more than that. 
those who had been faithful and had gone with him. And then Paul says in verses 8 and 9, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Paul says that there are two main reasons why he didn't deserve to have this special grace, to have Jesus appeared, raised up and alive to him. He didn't deserve it. It wasn't expected. As a matter of fact, it was very unexpected. Paul was going about his business, and Christ came to him and showed himself to, to Paul in an unexpected way. So first of all, verse 8. And last of all, as to one untimely born means, like one who was born out of time, born too late. It's like I was born too late to be included in the family, too late to deserve the great honor of having seen Jesus to all intents and purposes, except God's, as if I were still born and deserved to stay that way. He said, I deserve to be left out. But he came to me even though I came along late. And then secondly, he said, and I don't deserve to be an apostle at all. I'm in last place because I persecuted the church. The word for persecuted here means that he literally put to flight. He says, I hunted them down. I chased them. I pushed them. I pursued them. I was intent they couldn't escape. Acts 8.3, out of a translation called The Message, says this. But Saul just went wild, devastating the church, entering house after house, dragging men and women off to jail. And in Acts 22 and verse 4, it says, And I went after anyone connected with the way, went at them with all my might, ready to kill for God. I rounded up men and women right and left and had them thrown into prison. He was zealous and adamant and after these people. This was Paul's life. This was his mission, his reason to be alive until Messiah Jesus showed himself to Paul and it turned his life 180 degrees around. He completely changed. As a matter of fact, when he began telling people he had seen Jesus and that the gospel was true, many of those who had already trusted in the Lord wouldn't have nothing to do with him. We think it's a trick. He's just trying to get us to come in out of our hiding places and then we'll be thrown in prison. And it was scary for them at first. No wonder Paul writes then in chapter 15, 9, I'm the least of the apostles. I'm not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. The word apostle means messenger, one who is sent. But God's grace was greater. It was effective. It was expressed to Paul. It was caused Paul to throw himself intently into the work that God had for him to do. Listen to verses 10 and 11 of 1 Corinthians 15. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. He said, I've given you this list of eyewitnesses, and I'm here to tell you I've seen for myself that Jesus is raised from the dead, and I don't claim any good in me. This was God's grace, God's unearned favor. God chose me when I didn't deserve it. God put me to work by his grace. God made me a witness to the risen Lord. And so no wonder he said, I'm telling you about this. God's grace was at work in him. Whether it's one of those that he's listed here or Paul himself, he said, I preached it, you believed it. And that's why he's coming to the Corinthians. Remember, the book of 1 Corinthians is dealing with several problems, several issues that they had. Now he's going to go on and he's going to start getting into some of the details of things they really need to consider. Because <clears throat> it's an interesting thing. It isn't long after a church is formed that things start coming in and people start getting ideas and sometimes it's a direct attack from the enemy bringing in things that are heretical against god that are brought in other times they're just twists to something that, that is already being taught and so we're going to see how he deals with that the first and foremost thing what's the bottom line what does one need to believe to be born again that christ died on the cross for their sins 
that he was buried. It was a true physical death. That he was raised from the dead. That rising from the dead was the proof of the approval of the Father, the proof that all he had said in the time when he witnessed here was true, that eternal life was his to give. And he conquered death, and he conquered the curse of sin, and he did this for us. So that's the bottom line of what one believes to become a born-again Christian. Now, what should you know beyond that? That's what the rest of this is about. We'll continue, and we'll look into it when we next get together. Pray with me, will you? Lord, I'm thankful that you not only gave us the message, but it's well documented. These witnesses, these who have saw it, that's the kind of evidence you look for when you want to prove that something is so. And here it is listed out. Now help us as we look at this, that we would be ever more sure and firm in our faith and trust in Jesus and the effectiveness of his death, burial, and resurrection for us, and the truths that are going to be built on this that we'll get into next. Thank you for all you've done for us. Raise up your name in praise and thanksgiving and joy and blessing in us as we give you glory for what you've done. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. This gets good. It's already good, but it gets better. Come in next time and we'll go on and we'll see whatever God, whatever God has Paul tell us that we need to know about resurrection life. We'll see you next time.